Clarence Leonidas Fender was born on August 10, 1909 to Clarence Monty Fender and Harriet Elvira Wood, owners of a successful orange grove located between Anaheim and Fullerton, California. From an early age, Leo showed an interest in tinkering with electronics. When he was 13 years old, his uncle, who ran an automotive electric shop, sent him a box filled with discarded car radio parts and a battery. The following year, Leo visited his uncle's shop in Santa Maria, California, and was fascinated by a radio his uncle had built from spare parts and placed on display in front of the shop. Leo later claimed that the loud music coming from the speaker of that radio made a lasting impression on him. Soon thereafter, Leo began repairing radios in a small shop in his parents' home. In the spring of 1928, Leo graduated from Fullerton Union High School and entered Fullerton Junior College that fall as an accounting major. While he was studying to be an accountant, he continued to teach himself electronics and tinker with radios and other electrical items. He never took any kind of electronics course while in college. After college, Fender took a job as a delivery man for Consolidated Ice and Cold Storage Company in Anaheim, where he later was made the bookkeeper. It was around this time that a local band leader approached Leo asking him if he could build a public address system for the use by bands at dances in Hollywood. Fender was contracted to build six of these PA systems. In 1933, Fender met Esther Klosky and they were married in 1934. About that time, Leo took a job as an accountant for the California Highway Department in San Luis Obispo. In a depression government change-up, Leo's job was eliminated and he then took a job in the accounting department of a tire company. After working there six months, Leo lost his job along with other accountants in the company. So in 1938, with $600 he borrowed, Leo and Esther returned to Fullerton and Leo started his own radio repair shop known as Fender Radio Service. And soon thereafter, musicians and band leaders began coming to Leo for PA systems, which he began building, selling, and renting, and for amplification for the amplified acoustic guitars that beginning to show up in the Southern California music scene, and big band and jazz music, and for the electric Hawaiian or lap steel guitars becoming popular in country music. During World War II, Leo met Clayton Orr Doc Kaufman, an inventor and lap steel player who had worked for Rickenbacker Guitars, a company that had been building and selling lap steel guitars for a decade. While the Rickenbacker, Kaufman had invented the vibrola tailpiece, the precursor to the later vibrato or tremolo tailpiece, Leo convinced Doc that they should team up, and they started the K&F Manufacturing Corporation to design and build amplified Hawaiian guitars and amplifiers. In 1944, Leo and Doc patented a lap steel guitar that had been electric pickup already patented by Fender. In 1945, they began selling the guitar in a kit with an amplified design by Leo. By the beginning of 1946, Leo had decided that building and selling musical instruments and amplifiers would be a much more profitable than repairing them. Doc was unconvinced, pulled out of the company, and they parted ways. Leo changed the name of the company to Fender Electric Instrument Company and specialized in Fender lap steel guitars and amplifiers. Early in World War II, it was clearly shown that electric circuits had to be rugged to withstand the rigors of military use. Leo realized that amplifiers should be similarly rugged to withstand the abuse they would receive by traveling musicians, so he designed Fender amplifiers to be extremely rugged. During 1946, Fender designed and began manufacturing the Deluxe, the Professional, and the Dual Professional, along with the Princeton, a 4-watt practice amp. Pushing from 18 to 45 watts, these were easily the most powerful amplifiers commercially produced, with heavy steel chassis, chromed control plates, and heavy pine cases covered with tweed fabric, Fender amps caught on immediately. In 1948, Fender began the Champion series of practice amps, which eventually was called the Champ, and became the most popular amplifier built. Also in 1948, engineer George Fullerton was hired by Leo, beginning a partnership and friendship that would last for more than 40 years.
By this time, all commercially available amplified Spanish-style guitars were acoustic guitars with pickups added. Rickenbacker had designed a Spanish-style guitar made of Bakelite, a predecessor to plastic in 1935, and Shirley Leo was aware of its existence from Doc Kaufman. Fifteen miles from Fullerton, inventor and guitarist Les Paul was experimenting with a solid-body Spanish-neck electric guitar he eventually called The Log. But it pretty much has been accepted that Leo got the idea for designing a solid-body Spanish-style electric guitar from country guitarist Merle Travis, who had designed a solid-body electric guitar and had one built for him by Paul Bixby, another Southern California lap steel builder. In 1948, Leo Fender began working on a solid-body Spanish-style electric guitar. And in the spring of 1950, the first commercially available mass-produced solid-body Spanish-style electric guitar was introduced, the Fender Esquire. The Esquire had one pickup, and the body was one solid piece of ash wood. The neck was one solid piece of maple wood without a truss rod inserted and was bolted onto the body instead of the traditional method of gluing the neck to the body. The tuning heads were located all on one side of the neck and were designed in a way that the strings were parallel to the body of the guitar from the tuning head to the bridge. The Esquire had a tone selector switch, a volume knob, and one tone knob. It was available in two colors, black with a white scratch plate and semi-transparent butterscotch blonde with a white scratch plate. Most early models were of the latter color. In June 1950, Fender added a two-pickup model of the Esquire, and in November, it acquired a neck truss rod and was renamed the Broadcaster. In early 1951, Quartz Musical Instrument Company sent a telegram to Leo complaining of his use of the name Broadcaster, as Gretsch had a line of drums called Broadcaster, only spelled with a K. Fearing legal action and being a newcomer to the musical instrument industry, Leo immediately stopped putting the name label on the broadcasters until he could come up with a suitable new name. The guitars manufactured in this interim period are now known as no-casters and are rare and extremely desired. In late 1951, Leo changed the name to Telecaster to relate the guitar to the new and increasingly popular medium of television. The Esquire, Broadcaster, and Telecaster caught on quickly, mostly with country music guitarists, probably because country music was extremely popular in Southern California at that time. Within a year or two, the Chicago-based blues guitarist Muddy Waters could be seen playing one. Its distinctive, twangy sound became a standard for country music and remains so today. The Telecaster of the 2000s is relatively unchanged from the original. The upright bass or double bass was a problem for most bands. It is large, unwieldy, hard to successfully amplify, and is easily damaged. The first solid body fretted electric bass guitar was introduced by Audiovox in 1935, but it never really caught on, obviously due to the lack of proper amplification. In late 1951, Fender introduced the Precision Bass, a single pickup solid body bass guitar with a 34 inch scale with a fretted neck and a double cutaway body. The bassist was able to play with precision, hence the name. In early 1952, Fender introduced the Bassman Amplifier, a 35 watt amplifier designed for the precision bass. Authors note, supposedly, the precision bass caught on immediately. This early popularity was obviously in jazz bands because the electric bass isn't found in pop, blues, or rock and roll until 1955-1956. In blues and the earliest rock and roll, the upright bass often served as a percussive instrument as well as a stringed instrument. Despite the immediate popularity of the Telecaster, there were many guitarists that didn't really care for its signature twangy sound, and the many guitarists complained of its sharp edges uncomfortably biting into their sides while playing for long periods of time. To answer these complaints, in 1954, Fender introduced 
the Stratocaster with three pickups instead of two. A modern shaped, contoured body reminiscent of the wings that were beginning to appear on cars. A vibrato tailpiece that allowed the guitars to bend notes and a name that made one think of outer space. The Strat was an instant hit and eventually became the single most popular electric guitar. The Strat's contoured body style followed over to the precision bass. The basement amp went through several changes through the 1950s. In 1958, Fender began using the circuit design designated 5F6A, and this particular circuit was used in 1960. Through a mediocre bass amp, guitarists loved the tone and power of this amp, and it became much more popular for guitars than basses. Many people considered it to be the perfect guitar amp. In the 1960s, many amplifier manufacturers designed guitar amps based off of this circuit, including Jim Marshall, an amplifier based on the 5F6A with new modifications launched, Marshall Amplification. In 1960, Leo Fender introduced the deluxe model of the precision bass, and Leo felt that a thinner neck would appeal to jazz musicians and aid in the transition from upright to electric bass. The body was less symmetrical than the precision, more like the recently introduced Jazz Master and Jaguar guitars. The two pickups opposed to the single split pickup on the standard precision bass gave it a totally different sound. The Telecaster, Precision Bass, Stratocaster, and the Jazz Bass are testaments to the innovation of Leo Fender. All four instruments have remained extremely popular and modern versions have changed very little from Leo's original designs. Likewise, Leo's tweed amplifiers are considered by many the best amps ever made. The original fetch huge sums of money. Also, in the late 1990s, mostly due to the internet and the renewed availability of quality vacuum tubes, a new industry began to spring up boutique amplifiers. Boutique amps are high-quality, hand-built copies of classic amps, and the most popular are the 5F6A Baseman, the 5F1 Champ, designed by Fender in 1955, the 5E3 Deluxe, also in 1955, and the 5E8 Twin, also in 1955. Copies of these amps are also very popular, built by do-it-yourselfers, and kits are available of these circuits by several companies. Leo worked feverishly into the 1960s. He was a workaholic, usually working late into the night and often working seven days a week. He worked both on the business and R&D sides of the company. By early 1964, he was totally exhausted and his health was failing. And in 1964, he was approached by Columbia Broadcasting System, CBS, who was looking to get into musical instrument business. At the end of the year, Leo sold his beloved company to CBS for $13 million. Part of the agreement between CBS and Leo was a non-compete clause. Leo agreed that he would not participate in the musical instrument industry for 10 years after the sale. In 1971, Leo, Forrest White, and Tom Walker formed a new company called Trisonics Incorporated. Leo and Tom began designing amps, and Forrest began designing guitars, all carefully designed not to be confused with CBS Fender Instruments. Later they changed the name to Music Tech Incorporated, and by January 1974 to Music Man Incorporated. During this time, Leo did not take an active role in the company and did not until 1975, when it was officially announced that he had been elected president of the company. Music Man was fairly successful in the beginning, but by the late 1970s, it was a hard time for guitar and amplifier manufacturers. They made rugged amplifiers and functional guitars with enhanced electronics. In 1979, Leo's beloved wife Esther died of cancer. He remarried in 1980. By 1985, the performance of the company was bad enough that Leo left and the company was sold to Ernie and Sterling Ball. After leaving Music Man, Leo once again teamed up with George Fullerton and they formed G&L Guitars. G&L Guitars were styled similarly to Fender's original guitars 
with some cosmetic differences, but had much more modern electronics and tremolo systems. Leo continued to refine the designs he had originally created and received many patents for his later designs of pickups and tremolo systems and neck designs. Leo worked at GNL every day. He actually went to work the day before his death on March 21, 1991, despite having several small strokes and Parkinson's disease. He remained the same man he had always been, hardworking to near obsessive, friendly, unassuming. His coffee cup was a styrofoam cup with Leo written on the side, black magic marker. This man, who single-handedly changed the music industry and did more than any other one person to create the modern electric guitar, though he had taken piano lessons as a child, saxophone in a high school band, never learned how to play guitar.